Well, first of all, we do want to get the schools back in greater numbers. We've already seen that happening. Safe and stable and sure-footed steps, primary schools, but also as of Monday, um, secondary schools and those uh, in the exam years having more face time uh, with their teachers. Um, it's absolutely right. And we are sending a message that children coming back to school should be done and can be done securely. And we back that. We want to see it happen. And, and I wish Keir Starmer and the Labour Party would get off the fence and join with us as a political consensus to do so. On test and trace, we've already got the system up and running. And the tracers have been recruited. They're able to examine the contacts of 10,000 cases every day. The app's important, but it's important to get it right. It's been tested, and it will be, if you like, the cherry on the cake, and it will come up and running and operational when we're absolutely confident that it can have the best impact. But, it, but it's not right to say that test and tracing regime is not up and running. It is, and we've got the capacity to test um, uh, the contacts of 10,000 cases every every day. Yeah, but you and I both know that the, the, the app was supposed to be up and running mid-May, should have been up and running much sooner sooner than that. It was going to be world beating. Now it's not going to be around till winter. Uh, big concerns that we are not able to trace. We can't t- trace people we don't know who we've been close to if we have got the virus and or they've got the virus and infected us. And that's why a lot of parents are very concerned. There could be a major spike uh, in uh, in schools and we wouldn't know for a few weeks. Children aren't going to be routinely tested. The Labour Party calling for routine testing of all staff in the NHS and social care sectors. That hasn't even happened yet. So there's been uh, extensive uh, testing for key workers and uh, for staff uh, and indeed residents in care homes. Um, But the reality with with all of the incremental measures you take as you come through lockdown is you need to take steady, careful steps. That's why the Prime Minister set out a roadmap on the 11th of May. We're following that carefully. We're monitoring it very carefully. The app has all the experience of every other country that has had and put in place a test and tracing regime supplements the tracing mechanism that is done uh, through the tracers. Uh, it, it is not the central uh, component and it's the same with us and you're right we're going to have a well-beating app but we that's precisely why we need to test it and make sure we get it right. Um, but I'd come back to the point you talked about schools. We are getting more and more children this week uh, even more back to school um, and it can be done safely uh, children can go back safely parents should have the confidence to do that we're working with the teachers and the unions i think it would be helpful to have uh keir starmer come off the fence on this he's on you know, on the fence on brexit on the fence on so many things i think he's got to stand up and take a few positions or at least or if not let the government get on with its job this fence sitting, I don't think, is uh, is particularly helpful. Let's go back to your particular brief. You've got a, a, sure. a new part of your brief as Foreign Secretary, taking on the international development uh, budget. So 15 billion quid of taxpayers' hard-earned money, 0.7% of GDP. Likely to go down, obviously, next year as GDP falls. Um, but... Um, why, in taking the the foreign aid budget into the department, uh, your, your your department at the foreign office, why has there not been a decision to cut that 0.7 percent of GDP pledge? It was a back of the envelope uh, a pledge made at the time. No other country has done it. Why should so much of British taxpayers' money be spent on a lot of these international uh, projects, which often do no good for the ordinary people who really really need uh, foreign aid help, uh, and uh, and when no other country is doing it? It's precisely because we value aid, but also value getting uh, bang for our buck for taxpayers' money that we're bringing in the uh, aid budget and our well-beating development programme into the Foreign Office. So it's properly integrated with our foreign policy decision making. We're proud that we're helping some of the poorest people around the world. And uh, we've recently had this situation um, with the Gavi Summit hosted by the PM. We smashed all the records for international Uh, fundraising for $8.8 billion for a new vaccine. And I think it's a good example of where we need to integrate foreign policy decision making with our aid budget, but also where, well, yes, we've got a moral interest to help the very poorest and vulnerable in the world, but we want that vaccine for the British people too. So I don't quite accept this artificial dividing line, either between aid and wider foreign policy, or indeed between our moral sense of responsibility and the harder-edged UK national interest. Okay, and, and how important to international diplomacy and Britain's soft power is uh, having a, a plane that's not plain grey in our AF colours, but is that actually covered in red, white and blue flags at the cost of £900,000 to the taxpayer. Is that crucial? 
look, we have a maintenance budget that for, for all of our aircraft. It's a military um, uh, aircraft, so it, it, it has a whole range of uses. Um, but look, one and, and we, of course, care for the taxpayers' money. But, but of course, look, we've got um, the French coming over today, uh, President Macron. Uh, and he's coming over to pay a great honour on the people of London for our role in supporting de Gaulle and the French resistance during the war with Churchill. We're proud to have that highest honour that the French can bestow. And actually, do you know what, there's some things we ought to learn from the French. And they walk tall in the world. They, with the fleet we've got is nothing like the French fleet. Now, of course, taxpayers' money, cr critically important, no more than we need to project influence and to allow the PM to do his job, including uh, as the... Uh, leading the, 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 the charge for global Britain. But I do think that if to have the very best impact in the world, some of these symbols do have a resonance and do matter. And we should be walking tall in the world uh, because it not only is right for projecting our influence, but it, it, it yields much greater dividends financially in terms of jobs, in terms of investment into this country, which is well worth the investment that we put in. Okay. Well, you're talking about walking tall in the world, learning lessons from the French. Why don't we learn a few more lessons from the French and start being a there bit more go. proud of our history and proud of our culture? Emmanuel Macron made it very clear in address to the nation a few days ago that they would not be taking down statues. They would not be rewriting and whitewashing their past. We saw the horrific sight of Winston Churchill statue being boarded up because the police apparently and he seemed to be incapable of protecting it uh, from a violent protesters for Black Lives Matter. Um, we, we, we've seen it, OK, it's been uncovered for Macron's visit uh, today. When we now know that Cecil Rhodes' statue is going to be taken down at Oriel College in Cambridge, we, we, we've seen all of this Edward Colston statue ripped down. When is this government going to stand up for British culture, British history, British values and end this cancel culture that you know and I know the vast majority of British people do not stand by? Well, so first of all, in relation to the boarding up of Churchill, the Prime Minister was absolutely clear. It's ridiculous. Um, but that was the authority of the GLA, the London Assembly. And the PM had made very clear, particularly at a moment where President Macron is coming over to pay tribute to the cooperation that de Gaulle got in France's darkest hour from Churchill, that we should be proud of that. And more generally, I think we shouldn't airbrush our history in relation to uh, the Rhodes statue or Norial College. I think it's right there's a lawful and democratic process for deciding what goes where. I can give you one illustration in the Foreign Office. There's all sorts of uh, Muriel statues that people will question. I think we should have a debate about our history. We will talk about the Clive statue, well, that's for English heritage to discuss. But rather than airbrushing our history, I think the approach the Prime Minister takes and the approach that we take and I take in the Foreign Office is I look at the courtyard in the FCO. We've got spaces where we haven't put statues or monuments up. So actually, let's update that and make sure that, yes, it reflects the values and the symbols and the icons of the modern age. And do you know what? That's something that the Prime Minister and I have been talking about well before this crisis. So yes, update and, and revisit our history, but don't airbrush it. So you don't think that the Oriel College uh, Oxford should take down the statue of Cecil Rhodes? Well, it's ultimately for them to decide. And there's Your a whole opinion. Complicated. Look, I think more generally, um, I can understand actually why people, particularly young people, particularly BAME, uh, members of the BAME community, look at this and think, do you know what, that doesn't reflect my values. Why, I should, think why, why should a statue put up 100 years ago reflect the values of today? Well, I, I think when we put a statue up, we're symbolising um, all sorts of things, but particularly things that we're proud of. And you think of uh, the two sides of the coin with Rhodes. Um, but, but my point is, yes, let's have that debate. Let's do it lawfully and properly. But let's, rather than airbrushing difficult bits of our history, let's update it and refresh it, which is why, for example, in the Foreign Office and more generally, let's put up the statues and erect the statues to those who reflect the, the modern values. The, the, the challenge really here is, is we can, if we start airbrushing different generations' view of history, that's exactly what the next generation will do to us. I'm sure whatever we do, however uh, progressive we strive to be and this generation strives to be, 20, 30 years time, our children, our grandchildren look back and think, well, some of that was uh, somewhere between quirky or just something that doesn't reflect their values. But respect for history requires a little bit of empathy with the debate uh, at, at that time and at that point in history. And I think it's a mistake to lose sight of that. Just it's after watching the football last night, um, would you take a knee if you were asked to? Do you know what? I, I, I understand um, 
this sense of frustration and restlessness, which is driving the Black Lives Matters movement. I've got to say on this taking the knee thing, which I don't know, maybe it's got a broader history, but it seems to be taken from the Game of Thrones, feels to me like a symbol of subjugation, subordination, rather than one of liberation and emancipation. Uh, but I understand people feel differently about it, so it's a matter of personal choice. So would you or wouldn't you do it? Take the knee for two people, the Queen and, and the Mrs. when uh, I asked her to marry me. <laughs> Just finally, I must let's talk about the future just very briefly. Brexit, Emmanuel Macron. She, by the so, way, she she disputes that. I had this conversation <laughs> last night. I'm sure I did, but we'd obviously had too much champagne at the time. But I'm, I'm <laughs> certain I did. <laughs> we'll check with her next time we speak to her. Um, Emmanuel Macron, obviously, you mentioned here in the UK uh, for a, a very different reasons, but no doubt there'll be a little bit of chit chat about the issue of Brexit. It was made very clear last week and earlier this week there will be no extension to transition. You've been a staunch Brexiteer for many years, resigned as Brexit Secretary over the issue. Um, how confident are you? Give us a percentage that we are going to get some sort of European Union free trade deal by December the 31st. Give us a percentage chance. Well, do you know what? We've seen all sorts of political and economic forecasts. I'm not going to go down that blind alley. What I would say is it's great the French are coming over here. I'm proud that President Macron is going to be lighting up the Eiffel Tower with Union Jack. Uh, he's coming here to bestow, bestow the Légion d'honneur, the highest French award on the people of London for our role and the British people's role in supporting de Gaulle and the French resistance in their time of need. I think what it shows you is that we've bickered throughout our history with our French neighbours and friends, but we stand shoulder to shoulder uh, when it really matters. And I think the relationship between the Prime Minister and President Macron is close and very important. Mine with Jean-Yves Le Drian, the Foreign Minister, is and there's a whole range of things on Brexit, but also COVID cooperation, um, Hong Kong, where we just put out yeah. a G7 statement. Well, we work really closely. I think the significance of this visit is that even as we leave the EU, we've got this opportunity to be even better allies, partners and friends with our closest European partners. And this is a good example of that. We're safe. 